today the title of my talk is In the Space of the Immeasurable. So what are the words that come to mind when one speaks of the immeasurable? Infinity, eternity, feelings, emotions, intuition, imagination, spontaneity, creativity, dreams, memories, peace, harmony, love, and so on and so forth. The list is endless. Now we know of the five elements. In the Indian scriptures, the first element being space, often understood with use of words like ether, ether, spirit, sky. From the times of the Puranas, Plato, Aristotle, Einstein, Newton, Rudolf Steiner, Sri Aurobindo, and in more recent times, Laszlo and many philosophers, thinkers, scientists have dwelled upon this element, which came to be called the fifth element, which we believed was the first, which was the source of the next four elements, air, fire, water, earth. How do we see these playing out in our lives? We know that we can be as connected as the air, or we can rage like a fire, or be flowing with our ideas and thoughts like water, or be as rooted and yet in motion like the earth. But when it comes to space, this infinite, undefinable, unquantifiable element, what is it that actually manifests itself in our lives? And often have grappled with this question, what is it that is immeasurable within each one of us, within me? There is a joy I experience when I sing, when I perform, and that to me is immeasurable. Just as joy is immeasurable, I find pain too immeasurable. Now, I'm not talking of physical pain. We've managed to measure that. But when it comes to feelings and emotions, how does one measure that? I remember I lost my parents, and I lost them to death. I lost another very dear person, my friend, philosopher, guide, and much more, to death. And then it was in a court of law in an ugly court battle, that I was to be separated from my sons. And uh, that void that it left in my children's lives, I cannot imagine the magnitude of that. How does one measure the weight of unshed tears? How does one calculate the sorrow that is carried in tears? Well, I myself roamed around with a bottomless pit, a hollow in my heart and mind for a long time. And often I would have people say to me, oh my God, we'd be dead if we had to go through half of what you went through. And I would wish I was, actually, sometimes. And yet, I seem to go on. I seem to survive. And I wondered where that was coming from. Where was this faith in the universe, that some grace of the universe will prevail. Where was this coming from? Because that hollow that seemed to swallow every hope, every joy, every strength of mine now seemed to hold all of my inner strength. And that, I think, is there in each one of us, in every child that I come in touch with through my work, through theater, through film. And I think that is what is pre prevailing most of the time in our most vulnerable moments. That is where our inner strength springs out of. And it was at that time that I felt that this is where it is seeded. It is seeded in that fifth element, in that sky within. What is seeded is that thought. The seed of the thought dwells there. The origin of intuition, that strength, that inner strength, 
and it exists with a quality of diversity. That diversity which we find all around us in nature. You go take a look at a garden, you don't have a go-to garden, go look at a pot or look at some mud in a pot. It holds the power to give birth, to nurture growth, to make something blossom. And that exists in each one of us, in every child. Monoculture is not the way nature survives or sustains itself. And yet, we seem to buy into that idea, whether it is in our agricultural systems or whether it is in our educational systems. We seem to buy into the idea of mono-perfection. We want our children to be just one thing, and we tailor our educational systems to do just that. Why? And in the process, learning becomes so much of a pressure, and hardly a pressure. As recently as January 6th, the Times of India carried an article which said Karnataka lost one student every day to suicide. 1.47 to be precise, and Tamil Nadu topped the list with 2.68. How much is 0.47 of a child? How much is 0.68 of a child? Numbers can dehumanize. Surely they do. And yet we allow it. We buy into that idea. We endorse it. We encourage it. We even enforce it in the lives of our children. In classrooms, numbers matter. In schools, numbers matter. To a child, marks begin to matter more than their worth. It's all around us. In entertainment, eyeballs matter. In shopping malls, Footfalls matter. Where does the individual matter? It is in the arts and crafts. It is in farming that the individual and the larger context, the micro and the macro, both matter. And now, that brings me to that immeasurable part of the performer in every child. You know, there is the measured part of the performance, of course, which can be reduced to number of seats occupied, tickets sold. But I'm talking about the experience, the rasanubhava, as it's called. That shared synergy, that bond between the performer and the audience. That immeasurable response, that shared gaze between the two. It could be through laughter, it could be through applause, it could be through um, titter, a nervous cough, or it could be through just a silent tear, or plain silence. And this Rasanubhav is available to the child. Remember the times when, as a child, we played. You played things like house, house, under a bed. The cot itself became the roof of the house, and you played out roles of people who were part of your life, people you'd met or people you'd seen from a distance. And it was just for the fun of it, not to win, not to gain points. And there was something happening there. We were learning of life. And that doesn't seem to happen in the classroom, because there seems to be more competition than collaboration in the classroom. In theater, we are very vulnerable as actors. Very often, we are falling physically flat on our faces, or even figuratively. And that's the worst, because those scars don't show on the outside. But my god, they really hurt. And here, in the classroom, that very thing is happening. But there's no room for the expression of love, of true heartfelt hand-holding, for empathy, for sympathy, for compassion. Numbers. It's a number game. You can't have 30 kids in a class going and sitting and hugging each other out of sympathy. So it doesn't happen. But in theater, it's possible. It's happening all the while. And often we fall on our faces, and uh, the situation demands that you get up on your own, dust your bottom, and get on with it. But there is somewhere this knowledge of being in the same boat, of being together, of knowing that one is not alone. And in that, just developing that inner strength, that sky within, 
that space within which allows you the freedom to make mistakes, to learn easily and effortlessly from someone else's mistakes and your own. And in that, the learning gets internalized. It, is, it all happens in a very free manner. And that is what happens in farming. You throw a seed. If a child gets to throw a seed and watch something grow, the child learns of life's processes right from birth to death and everything in between without anything being repressed or suppressed. Learning is not disjointed. But in our classrooms, we seem to box our children into rooms. And then we do that for years. And later on in life, we're telling them to think out of the box. As Aurobindo said, the first principle of true teaching is that nothing can be taught. There was an actor who came, and um, we were doing a play, and we were workshopping, and he, we had to play hide and seek. And it was his turn to take the den, so gladly he did. And he started counting. But he stood in the middle of the room with his eyes open and started counting. So we said, no, you have to close your eyes and then count. So he stood right there and closed his eyes and started counting. And we said, no, you have to go to a wall at the side and then count. So he goes to this wall, but he's still standing in the center of the wall and facing us. And we said, we can't hide with you facing us, even if your eyes are closed. And I was exasperated by then. And I said, come on, haven't you ever played hide and seek before? Don't you know how to play it? Back came the answer in a feeble tone. No. He said, I played structured games. We played tennis, basketball, football, badminton, and such games. We just stood there shocked. But after that, we played hide and seek every day. Now, this, this was an actor who knew all the techniques. He had them all at his beck and call. He knew them. He had learned them. But it wasn't available to him when it came to actually expressing himself or finding the child within. As Steiner says, we can find nature outside of us only when we have first learned to know her within us. What is akin to her within us must be our guide. This marks our path of inquiry. And we played hide and seek every day after that for quite some time to come. And something happened, something immeasurable, something I cannot quantify for you. But something happened, and he found it. This actor was able to do what was required. He had found the child within. And this is what we are hoping will happen in education. Because we seem to be losing out on our traditional learning systems. We seem to be losing out on the wealth that is possible for us through those. We are losing out on our lullabies. Mothers are hardly singing the lullaby to their children. And I believe the lullaby holds People's songs, yes, but people's stories. The song of the heart, the dance of emotions, that is what the lullaby holds. And we seem to be losing that. We find even in the crafts, people are forgetting how to make those knots. They know the steps in between, but they're forgetting how to begin a piece and how to end it. Even a simple thing like a gajra. We don't know how to begin it and end it. We know the knots in between. But we don't know how to tie it up. And that is very precious. Because if we lose what is precious in the hands, if we lose dexterity, then we're losing something immeasurable in our hearts and minds. Something that allows us to construct, deconstruct, and reconstruct. This can happen through farming, natural farming, arts, and crafts. So the points I make in conclusion are open the sky within to the sky without. Include natural farming arts and crafts in education. Nurture traditional and contemporary knowledge systems. Imagine a child making a film on the flora and fauna in his village, or a child making an, a theater piece, or uh, 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 an animation film on a weave that is peculiar to her village. That would be priceless. And we need to do this with no grading. 
let us value rather than evaluate. For us to be able to draw from our hearts all that is precious from the sky within to the sky without. Thank you very much.